This month, we're taking a look at how the computational thinker can formulate and work their way in science. So when we think about this, we want to go back to those ISTE standards that we've been looking at all along. And now we're going to talk about the computational thinker. Well, remember that when you go to these standards that you can open and close the performance indicators with the click of the button. And that as you read each performance indicator, that you can roll over any of the underlying terms and you can get a further definition of what that term means. Now when we think about what the computational thinker does, they're a person, in this case a student, who formulates problems, who engages in algorithmic thinking, who collects data, identifies relevant data sets, and represents their data in various ways. And we're going to give you some examples of that. They also break problems into their parts, and they understand how automation works. Now, this is a great standard, but it's really the basis of a larger set of standards that comes from CSTA, which is the Computer Science Teachers Association. And they have a set of K-12 science standards, computer science standard, standards, that begin with grades kindergarten to five, and you can see as I go into this document, and this is a draft document, but you can see what the standards are, what the conceptual framework is, and what the practice framework is. And so if you're really looking to get deeper into this, I would really encourage you to take a look at those computer science standards. Now, so let's, let's go back a second and think about what it is that we want students to be able to do. So one of the big things is having students collect data and identify data, relevant data sets. Now we've covered this type of uh, uh, thing before where you can make a form for collecting data. And you'll notice, so I have a model lesson here and I'm gonna collect the data. And this is a form that I would put, put out to my students through a, a shortened URL. And I might ask for their name, although I could collect that uh, from them. And in this case, I might have them measuring uh, vinegar. So if we're doing uh, an experiment with vinegar and baking soda, we could have them put their answer in. And notice down here that we can go to something called data validation. right? <clears throat> and when you go to data validation, you can make sure that whatever answer they put in here is a number. Now, there are a whole bunch of other choices that go here that you could ask them for a number greater than zero, equal to something, or between something. And so there are all kinds of options to make sure that the data that you get is really um, what you want. Now, sometimes I would allow my students to make mistakes in putting their data in just to see what we might get. Now, when we look at the back side of that form, so here's my model lesson data collection, and you can get the responses simply by clicking and seeing what the numbers are, and it gives you nice information, but what I really want is to click here where I can review the responses in a spreadsheet. So now I have these responses that have come in. And what I want you to notice is that if, in, if you mix baking soda and vinegar, of course, you get a change in temperature that is negative. But you know, when you just ask students to put in the change in temperature, they may not always put in positive and negative numbers. And so you can show them a graph where you might see a nice trend, positive trend, but also a negative trend depending on where they put their their values in, positive or negative. And so there's a lot of um, a lot of advantages to doing this type of data collection in, in that this creates a model of a big data set. So if we go back to the questions, right, I can share this not only with my students, but with students across the hall, across the, the town, across the county, across the state, across the country, and across the world. Anybody could be engaging in the same lab and we could create a large data set here that would give us lots of data points. So the students only have to do it one time. But in addition, students can design their own experiments and they should be able to build a form to be able to collect data. And so this is a great way to, for students to work on science fair type projects where they're going to collect data over a wide range. Now we also want students to be able to find data and find data sets. And so there are um, lots of places online. We highlighted a few in our article um, where you can go, and one of those is data.gov. 
So this is the home of the U.S. government's data. And so, like, there's a science and research tab, and there's health tabs, agriculture, climate. So you can get all kinds of data in here. So if I go up and I click and I put in a term like eclipses, what happens is it tells me that it found 20 data sets for it. And these may or may not be something that I'm looking for, but when you start thinking about what students can investigate, there's all kinds of data that they can get simply by being able to go out and find it. Now, another way that they can look at, at data is through Google Trends. And we've looked at this before, but again, like if we look at like eclipses, what, what's interesting is that when do you think people are searching for eclipses? Probably when there's um, eclipses occurring. And so you can actually start to see like when those may turn up. Now, if we change this, as we've shown before, and we do something like tsunami, we can start to see again when tsunami occurred, and we can compare by adding another term like earthquakes to see what happens here. And so, so earthquakes will be in the red, and what you'll notice is that they, they become aligned a little bit, that when an earthquake and a, a tsunami uh, are being searched for, a lot of times there are some overlaps as people are doing that type of research. So when we jump back to the standards again, and we start thinking about having students using um, data analysis, what I would point out is that the nice thing about getting this model data in here is that you can quickly uh, start to put in um, those kinds of terms that allow you to um, do things like averaging. So you can type in equals, average, and you can choose the types of terms that you want Okay, and it will highlight this for you. Or what's the median? Or however you may want to look at it. So there's all kinds of data analysis tools that allow you to be able to work through uh, um, how you analyze your data. Now we've talked about collecting and identifying re rel relevant data sets. But what about representing them? Well, one way to represent data sets would be through the use of something like an infographic. And we highlighted like easily is one and picked a chart is another tool that allows you to create um, these types of um, infographics. So this one is, is really about information, the seven fundamental metric units and the prefixes and students will put their, their information in. Um, we can have uh, students do an infographic on how to add vectors. And so they can put in their own um, sort of procedure, way of thinking about things. And we'll come back to that in one moment. But you could also have them represent a lab. Like here was a momentum and impulse lab where students put in their own pictures. They uh, make a blog where they could add video, but they can put all of their explanations in. And, and this becomes something that allows them to, um, as we go back to the standard, represent their data in various ways. Now, the next part is, is to engage in those kinds of um, thinking that would be algorithmic thinking. And so um, to, to work on that, we sometimes have students do flow charting. And this might be a flow chart where students are um, going through and they're flow charting the steps in a lab and linking things out. But you know, for an algorithm, it's the same type of thinking. Like what are the steps that you might go through in solving a problem? And so there are all kinds of graphic organizer tools. This one is Lucidchart, but Poplet is another one and MindMap and MindDomo. And these types of, of tools allow students to be able to um, engage in this type of algorithmic thinking by laying out their concrete sequential steps for solving problems. That can be really helpful for students, I think. And then we also want them to understand how automation might work. And so as an example, uh, I do this with my students um, where I have them uh, take a look at some data at, that um, they have to analyze where this expression right here is zero. And so I've started out with an initial step uh, an initial value of zero and a step size of one. And what we can see is that between zero and one, it goes from negative one to 
474, so that means that the answer is actually in between those numbers. Well, that's interesting. What if I change this to a tenth? Well, now what I can see is my answer is somewhere in between these two. And so that allows us to change things quickly by working through a spreadsheet, this type of iterative process. So now I know that my answer is between 0.5 and 0.6. Well, I need to narrow down my step size to maybe 0.01. Well, now, look at this. Now it looks like my answer is somewhere between 0.58 and 0.59. So I can start at 0.58. And I know my answer is there, but I want to change it to... 0.001, and now I can see uh, right here, that's where it looks like my answer is actually equal to zero. And that's a very quick way to take a look at it. And if you were thinking like, how, so how do we do that? What I did was I just put my value in here, and this is whatever that value is plus the step size filled on down. And this is the actual expression that I have here typed into a format that Excel can take. So when we go back to the standard and we start thinking about all the types of things that we have to do, from the very simple experiments to the very complex, there's a lot of opportunities for students to employ computational thinking as a part of their science lessons. So join us next in the next couple months where we'll be addressing the last of the ISTE standards and then finally how do we put all this together.